Hey, folks, welcome to another episode of the Agency Freedom Podcast. I'm your host, James Jenkins, and we are here to take our listeners from captive to indie to market domination. Thanks for joining us for yet another adventure. Uh, This conversation, I think, is going to be high energy. I don't mind saying it. I'm pretty amped to come in here and have a conversation with Miss Caitlin Egger. Uh, She is Allen, right? Allen, Texas. That's where you hail from? That's that's right, James. Right down the road from you guys at Riskwell in the great state of no, Texas. You know, I am in McKinney, uh, which if you know anything about the Dallas-Fort Worth area, I, it's literally a 10, 15-minute drive for where uh, Caitlin is. So if I had been thinking about it, I would have invited her to here in person so we could do this a little bit differently. Because I imagine you're probably one of the only people I'm going to be talking to on this podcast <laughs> that I could drive to nearly as easily. Uh, so anyways... Thank you so much for joining uh, us on, on this interview for Making Time. I know how busy you are with all of the many things you and Justin and your team are doing with Quantum. And, uh, yeah, the we're just going to just jump right in. I don't mind saying it, you Great. guys. I don't know anything about Caitlin. She and I haven't prepped for this, as in so many of our episodes. Uh, I think the content is just so much more interesting for the listener if there's not canned responses and and trite things. The hard part, I don't mind sharing this with with you guys openly that are listening to this. If you don't know already, Caitlin Egger is kind of a big deal. Uh, She hosts her own podcast on the Insurance Podcast Network, and uh, you can listen to her on the Age of Independence uh, which is, is an entirely separate conversation. But the hard part for me as the new guy in town, as the podcast host, is so many of the people that I have on as a guest have been on a lot of podcasts as guests already because you're interesting, you're a good interview. There's lots of content that comes from you. But as in previous conversations, I will commit to our listeners, I will not be duplicating or being reductive of other Caitlin Egger interviews. So... That's the hard part because you've been in a lot of interviews, lady. Like you, you, you have a lot to say in our industry. You, as you said before, you're a nerd for this stuff. You love it. So there love you go. It. There's love my so intro much. for you. I'm not your spokesperson, but I guess kind of, right? So, hey, why don't you give us the two, three-minute version, who you are, and what you love most about what you're doing right now and our independent industry as a whole. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for that introduction, James. And I have been wanting to have a chat with you for a while, so I'm so glad we're finally getting to um, just talk about the insurance world. And I always have time to chat with our agency friends in the industry, and there's just so much going on that um, I'm sure we'll get into some hot topics today. But I, I have to say, before I get into more about me, I I do want to brag on your podcast a little bit, James, because I've been trying to catch as many episodes of Agency Freedom as possible, and the episodes that you're bringing are so content-rich. I just want to thank you for bringing a fresh angle to this conversation. Age of Independence has a similar message about how to succeed in the independent world, especially if you're making the leap from captive. but. It's uh, nothing I'm hearing on agency freedom is redundant. And y'all, this is the kind of podcast where if this is the first episode you're listening to, dial it back to episode one, get out a notebook and a pen, and you really want to be taking notes when when you're listening to James uh, and his content. So thanks for bringing stuff to us that really helps fill that education gap in the insurance industry. And I think that's something you and I have in common. Um, I absolutely love education. I'm the director of education and development at Quantum, and I spend my time trying to help our team members at Quantum and our agency force really crack the code to high volume new business growth and um, how how to uh, launch successful agencies and, and solve some of those problems that we all face when we're growing. So thanks for having me on. And and for creating this this really great resource uh, for for agents as far as what I love the most oh my gosh I know it's a hard There's question so because you seem like the kind That's of person who so has a long list of things that you love you know you, you, you are that, that warm and friendly demeanor that I feel like your list is probably a lot longer than mine just because your disposition is so positive I don't run out of enthusiasm James I have the best job in the world I love it so much so 
I love our team. I get to work with my husband. I have the best like career, work life balance like that I could possibly ever want. But I think what I love the most is the opportunity that I have to take what I've been given and try to multiply it and see it hopefully change someone else's life. And so um, I have that background as an agency owner in the captive side as well as the independent side, but now as the director of education, I really feel like, you know, I've been blessed with so much and I feel like my story could have been so much different if anything had changed. And like my husband and I worked really, really hard to build what we have now. We put in a lot of hours, but like what if we hadn't been healthy enough to do that. There's so many things that I think about that could have thrown a wrench in our success, things that I'm just so grateful that we were healthy, we had the family support, we were able to do this, and I feel like it's my responsibility now to take what I've been given and turn it into something that is a stepping stone for other people. And so I think that's what I love most is that, man, if I do a good job with this challenge on the other end of that is a life-changing career for someone else. Insurance was life-changing for me, and now my responsibility is to try to help other people, whether they're starting out as insurance professionals or starting out as agency owners, in my case, to be able to have that thriving career that insurance can offer. That Insurance can truly change someone's life it can be the career that a family's been praying for and it can change the financial course for generations and so i think that's um pretty neat and it's it's what um, drives me to put in those hours that you were talking about man i could not resonate more with what you just described a lot of those things apply to my, my family as well now i didn't find insurance as an industry until i was um, 29 or 30 and you know it it makes me kind of wonder, what am I doing with the first 10 years of my career? Um, right. What, what was your background before? I don't know how long you guys were uh, owning an all-state office. Um, what was it before, or did you uh, come into the adult segment of your life and quickly find the insurance industry? Uh, I don't presume to know what happened at all with you and Justin. I don't really know anything at all about your story. I'd love to hear that. Like, how did how did uh, you and Justin launch this thing? Was that after the two of you were together in a thing, or did that happen prior? Like, what's your story with getting into the industry to begin with? Oh, sure. Well, I was 25 when we opened our first agency, so we have that in common because I was in my mid-20s, and I had never had insurance on the radar before. And, um, man, I think that's a story we can change, James, is that, like, who goes through high school or college and says, I want to grow up and be an insurance agent one day? People are not thinking about that. They, are, they have no idea the advantages that it could create for their professional goals, for the kind of lifestyle they want to have for their family. People have no idea. And so I think insurance has a branding problem. We can talk about that. But I would love it if one day people who find themselves in the shoes that I was in when I was 25 knew about insurance and had a pathway to be able to launch that successful career. So that I was the 25-year-old who had been in retail sales um, and done very, very well in retail sales, um, but super young, right? All I knew was like, I love sales and I don't love retail. So <laughs> I knew I wanted to continue in some sort of management or leadership role. I knew that I wanted to do sales coaching and I didn't know what I didn't know, right? So um, Justin and I got married when I was in my early 20s. We lived in North Carolina at the time. And when we got married, we were like, oh, well, you know what? He was doing, um, he, he was in a business that had services for accountants where he managed their call center. And he knew he wanted to get out of that. We were young. I knew I wanted to get out of retail, but stay in sales. And so when the insurance thing happened, we were the young people in our 20s that were like, this is a great opportunity. We're going to go make it happen. And we did. But in hindsight, man, um, we, we were the people who just went all in <laughs> with no fear. And in hindsight, I'm more, I like kind of like when I think about it now, I'm like, ah, <laughs> maybe we, 
<laughs> what were we thinking? But we, we moved to Illinois. We launched uh, an agency, Scratch Captive Agency, startup, boutique location, small, family-owned business style in a cute little town that's not unlike McKinney. It's Geneva, Illinois, super cute town with a little downtown area. And we just decided to do insurance. But what that meant was that when we opened our doors, we until that point, we had just gotten licensed. We had no insurance experience. So the past 10 years for us has been our journey of starting as startup agents who didn't know anything about the industry and using the skills that had helped us succeed previously in sales for myself and business for Justin to begin figuring it out and growing thriving agencies um, just uh, our journey in a nutshell, we we love the startup thing. Like we've never purchased a book of business up to this point. Um, having been in the industry 10 years, we don't think there's anything wrong with that, but we just love the startup culture, the opportunity, we've done it well. We really love high volume new business sales and helping agents figure that out. And so that's kind of been our world since then. And um, going through all the trials and tribulations of figuring that out from day one to trying to take what we were learning and what was working and building upon it to get to where we are now. Hmm. No, I, I love that. That's man. Hearing other people's version of the same story that I've been living the last eight years is always so encouraging. You know what I mean? It just reaffirms decisions that my wife and I made and a lot of other families and husbands and wives and, and individuals that aren't in a, a couple situation where, you know, they're out there just making decisions for themselves without uh, mm-hmm. a tribe or without someone to bounce ideas off of all of those things. It is, it is really encouraging uh, to hear the, the, the dialogue internally of what did you want? Uh, what was missing from retail? Uh, what was missing uh, from <laughs> insert previous career here for me gosh it was literally all over the place i did food service yeah. management i did retail i did telecom i did higher education contract work it's, yeah i mean it's so cool to hear the all the different ways that people get to the industry and once they're in the industry man there's different flavors there there's so many different versions of success I think that is mm-hmm. maybe one of the things that I like most about the insurance industry, specifically the independent insurance industry, obviously. I'm a l- Particularly. Little bit biased there. A little bit more versions for success over yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, there is a very small box, and success is a vanilla ice cream cone with no toppings mm-hmm. and no other flavors. No, no flavors allowed. It's vanilla or no. I, obviously, it, it's it's really cool to see your version of success. I don't know of another industry, and I know I'm riffing on Jason Cass here and what he said of the, you know, the greatest industry that God ever created. It's amazing. But name another industry that has so many different ways to succeed. You can do almost anything you want to do within the insurance world. I, it's so cool to hear your version of it, so thank you for that. Um, gosh, you guys had quite the journey you were running a very large, very successful Allstate agency. Uh, one of my local friends here, I don't know if you know Brooks Cannon. Um, she, she was a, a very large Allstate agent here in, in Plano, Texas. Uh, her book was you know, well north of, of $10 million in premium, which for a captive agent, that's a big book. But for a captive, y'all, that's That not is easy. a very large blocks. book for a captive agent. Many roadblocks. So uh, I, I think from what I've heard from it, I don't mean to speak for Brooks because I'll have her on as a guest at some point if she, if she wants to be. But uh, from what I understand, you guys were enjoying the pinnacle of success with Big Blue. Uh, and obviously, uh, I said a name, so I'll just say it in this episode for those of you that haven't heard previous episodes where you're going, ooh, he named a carrier. Is he supposed to do that? It's like, it's okay. <laughs> We're no, we don't do any bashing on Agency Freedom Podcast. I don't think that's, one, it's unprofessional, it's impolite, and two, it's a great way to get sued. And I don't really have any interest in being sued by a carrier. I know my guests certainly don't. So we'll always be factual. If we're naming names, we're always just totally factual. 
um, not making any value judgments uh, at all. We can speak in factual terms of pros and cons. This is something the carrier or the captive model is good at. This is something that, in my opinion, they're bad at. Like, we can stay factual. So I I always want to say that because you and I don't know each other personally yet. But I always feel like it's a good idea to say that up front so someone feels free to, you know, speak freely without having to, like, couch terms or, or talk to their own compliance department or whatever. Uh, right. All, all no. I can say. <laughs> well, what I can say is I'm so grateful for the time that I did have in the captive world. I Yes, I look back on it and I'm like, oh, why didn't I make the jump sooner? But in hindsight, uh, you know, everything – really fell into place at the right time. And while I was um, a captive agency owner for, uh, you know, every captive has their different, you know, scorecards or, you know, recognition trips, but we were inner circle elite every year that I was an agency owner uh, consecutively. And my last year as an agency owner with the captive, we were best in region for a multi-state territory. And so our team had a lot of fun. We did some great things. We had a fun run of it. And I learned a ton during that time. And I think it really positioned me to be ready for the independent world. And yes, I think the grass is really green on the independent side. There is a huge horizon of opportunity in front of you that you need to know about if if you haven't experienced it yet. But there's also challenges. And James is really good about highlighting what those are so that you can prepare for them. And I'm just really I really glad that the timing was right so that I was prepared when I when I made the transition independent. So there are a lot of different versions of the freedom jump. Uh, a lot of different ways mm-hmm. that people get to the point where they realize that the captive business model is not the best fit for them anymore. A lot of those people uh, don't ever achieve anything remotely close to the scale of what you guys had because you don't get to be best in region with a major captive carrier unless you're running a very solid operation, unless you're running something that is just spit and polish, it is what it needs to be. So I would love to hear a little bit of dialogue from you, Caitlin, on what it means when you reach what is very nearly the pinnacle of the captive world, your best in class, whatever all states version of President's Council is. We, in farmers, they called it PC, <laughs> President's Council. Yeah. Whatever that is, mm-hmm. Chairman's Circle or whatever little made-up thing, I'm sure you guys were, were that consistently. What does it mean when you reach the pinnacle of one version of the industry? How did you guys go from what was undoubtedly a very large revenue stream, a recurring revenue mm-hmm. stream, too? to go, you know what, mm-hmm. I think we're done here. I think we're going to look for, for the exit. You know, it was something that I had not even considered for the longest time. Like, I was in my bubble. I was happy. There was no reason to look outside the bubble. It was nowhere on my radar. I didn't have friends that were independent agents. Literally had n- no knowledge of the independent world at all because I hadn't pursued looking into it at all. I knew nothing about it. And... I, at some point between when we moved from Illinois to Texas and when I sold my Illinois agency and we moved down here, something about that life change was when I started thinking, okay, so it's been great, but what else is out there? And someone had reached out to me in the independent world, and I think that kind of like, you know, poked that little bubble a little bit. And here, here's what it was. Yes, we were at the pinnacle, but we were at the pinnacle of someone else's goals, someone else's articulation of what agency success looks like, not what I thought an agency could do. And it, I, I really loved that in the independent world, you get to decide what agency success looks like for your agency. It's one of the reasons that at Quantum, we don't set sales goals or sales metrics or life insurance requirements for our agency force. You determine what that's going to look like. You determine what your PNC, uh, like personal lines, commercial mix of business is going to look like, how, you know, your staff, and we support you in that. And we, 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 set up an environment where you can leverage the expertise that we have in the many areas it takes to succeed as an agency so that your business plan can become a reality. Um, but I, I really felt like that was 
the tipping point for me was I'm done chasing someone else's goals for what they're saying to find success for what I can do. And what was holding me back was really more of an emotional thing. It was more like, I have all these friends in the captive world. I'm on all of these groups and I get to go tour agencies and have round tables and speak at events and I get to uh, interact with these other people in the captive world. And I, I felt like I'd be leaving all of those friendships behind and rebuilding my insurance network from scratch, which is true, but I think that emotional tug was really the the thing that made me maybe delay or like you know uh procrastinate a little bit about what i knew was going to be right and then i think another thing that for me just that i remember having a light bulb moment was when i was thinking about diversifying my portfolio and i was like do i really want to have all my eggs in one basket and so it, the independent world just made sense for me at that point. And then once, once I transitioned over, I felt this huge sigh of relief when I realized that I had made the decision that really was best for clients and that was best for team members that, that come on board to, to work at the agency. Um, we're really, clients deserve options. We're positioned to be able to match them with the true carrier fit for what their family or what their business needs. And by doing that, we're setting up our team members to have a very successful insurance career in insurance. And so um, I'm really glad that, that I did it. And, and it's, been, it's been fun. I want you guys that are listening to pay close attention to what Caitlin just said. She laid out exactly what it means when you get to the end of the rope and you realize that you're on the wrong rope. When you, chasing someone else's goals, you said that. That's probably the title of this episode. You reached someone else's goals. You were best in class at, at what you guys were at that time. Uh, there might be others who were in that same group, but you were uh, the prototype uh, big captive agent, and uh, you willingly walked away from probably a scary number. Uh, for you as as a wife, as a mom, as the, the nurturing provider, the, the mindset. Uh, we'll get into that in just a second, but, I, man, I imagine that was very difficult to walk away from that renewal income that at that point was probably very significant. Uh, were you able to take your team with you uh, when you guys left, or, or was there a period of cooling off or separation between when you left the Allstate office and when uh, Quantum came into being? Well, the when I sold my Illinois agency, we were in Texas. So we helped match them up with other um, agencies right. in the no, area. No, no, sorry. The, so there was a geographic uh, transition, yeah. not just a career, uh, you know, industry yeah. vertical <laughs> or, or channel, I should say, yeah. transition. So th but, I, I should have paid closer attention to the geographic <laughs> switch. I would have answered my own question, right? Um, so why don't... That's okay. But, um, yeah, I w when we moved to Texas, Justin launched a Texas agency. His story is different, really, than mine, and so he'd be, you know, happy to – he's always a fun guy to chat about um, his experience as well. But, but yeah, one, we did – we one thing we – it took us a while to figure out, but one thing we're really good at is talent. We have an amazing team, and um, some of them that eventually were – um, with Justin when he launched Quantum had been with his previous um, agency. So there was two different agencies involved, huh? I, I didn't I didn't mm -hmm. think to even ask that question. For some reason, I thought you guys were, you know, on the same uh, the same track, the same wavelength. But uh, so there was multiple yeah. agencies. Yeah, we kind of have two different journeys. Yeah, I um, after we moved to Texas, I launched my independent insurance agency, which. Um, Man, I like I said, I knew nothing yeah. about the independent world, and so let's, it was a quite an experience. It, I should say experiment, um, and that was before Justin ever had even thought of quantum. We it, we had ne the idea of quantum had never even been born at that point. It was really born out of my experience in the independent world and just seeing like whoa there's so many things we could fix <laughs> and so um it was really born out of a need a real need there's a real gap in the industry for making sure the agents have the right tool belt 
to be able to grow and scale and wanting to make sure that that was, was created for them. So I ended up selling my independent agency, and after Quantum had been launched, I wanted to, to join Quantum and be a part of what we're doing. It's just amazing what has happened and the impact we're making on the industry. And so while I loved being an agency owner and that was what was on, that was my long-term plan, once we realized that Quantum could really fill a huge gap, I, I wanted to be a part of it. So now my husband and I work together again. No, I bet you are much happier to have the two ships, you know, merging and becoming one again. I can't oh, yeah. even imagine having. And you work with your spouse and you love it. I, I absolutely love it. And you know, <laughs> I, I like to say that Allison is the only person I don't get tired of. Um, literally everybody else, I need some sort of, okay, you go over there, I'm going to stay over here, and let's just do something else for a day or two, and then we can come back, you know, the whole Monday through Friday thing. But, yeah, the idea of not having Allison as an active participant in the business, I can't tell you how many couch conversations there are where, yeah, she's not in the office at all right now. She's a full-time professional mm -hmm. mom. At some point, she'll be back, and she'll be actively mm -hmm. engaged, you know, officing in the space. But we're, we're probably two or three years away from that, if I had to guess. Um, but, yeah, I imagine it is just a wonderful blessing for you guys to get to be sharing that part of your life as well. Um, I, I have to... Well, and I think that the spouses of entrepreneurs and of insurance agency owners specifically often feel like they work in the agency because they do hear about it non -stop. <laughs> on those, when you're drinking coffee on the couch nonstop. She and I have to have, uh, and it hasn't been that big of a deal since we had kids uh, because there's lots of other things to talk about for sure. Uh, but before, <laughs> before our, our son was born, we had to have a rule of, hey, okay, no work talk. Uh, sitting on the couch. If we're on the couch, no work talk. Otherwise, we would never do anything <laughs> but talk about work because at that point, right? it was it's just she and I and we had one other team member. It was just the three of us. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it is crazy for some people listening to this because, as we've said before, and we haven't said it in a couple of episodes, so I don't mind repeating myself, there's really two buckets of people that listen to AFP. There are the captive agents who are still on that side of the fence, and you're still checking things out. You're still inquiring, or at the very least, curious, interested. Maybe you find us entertaining, or maybe you're doing like opposition research, trying to understand how the independent mind thinks so you can better beat us at the insurance game. It just occurred to me that there might be people listening trying to get intelligence on the enemy. Okay, well, that's fine. You're welcome to be here, too. No no harm of that. They'll join soon. <laughs> You'll figure out soon enough it's just easier to come over and be an IA and do your own thing. But those people that are still on the captive side that are listening to this, they're going to have a really hard time like rationalizing what you've shared in the last few minutes of reaching the absolute pinnacle of a major uh, carrier and willingly walking away and going to do your own thing Help me figure out what that I, looks like. That's an e How did you rationalize that? That's an easy that? one, though. Be well, it's a lot easier to rationalize when you're really comfortable writing high-volume new business. And the reality is most agents are really good at retaining clients and keeping clients happy, but they're struggling to tread water and to sell enough new business to make up for what they lost in retention for the year. And so even if they have a $10 million book for that person – and I don't mean the particular agent you mentioned, just hypothetically a random agent who has a large book of business, they might have a hard time trying to sell $100,000 a month or $200,000 a month or these numbers. And when you are really great at sales and you know how to bring on new clients, it's not so scary anymore thinking about, you know, oh, what about the renewals? Because you have a mechanism for fueling your agency growth and you're strong on the front end. And so that doesn't mean you don't care about retention. It doesn't mean you don't have a rock star client care team, um, but it means that your business plan is gonna look a little bit different than someone who is just trying to make up for what they what they lost for the year. So I believe that agents of you know any size can 
pursue high volume new business growth. There's a couple different methods that you can take to do that. On the independent side, a big part of that's going to be introducing commercial into your portfolio. And Riskwell's done such a good job of transitioning from personal lines to commercial. And you talk a lot about that on agency freedom. And that's that's huge. Yep. Um, it's yes. things like the what kind of training and onboarding resources are you providing to your team members when you bring them on board to make sure that they are selling with purpose and that they know how to overcome objections to the quote so they have enough at bats to be able to build the rapport that you're counting on them to build so that they can close business and bring it on board and being confident and comfortable in new marketing methods that allow you to broaden your reach outside of your agency outside of your local area so that you can reach the volume that you need to to be able to hit those big numbers but once you're able to get those items into the mix it changes the story of your agency it changes the culture of your team and it transforms the um the atmosphere and it, it becomes a little bit more higher pace you start building momentum which uh sales teams really feed off of momentum and energy and so Closing new business does so much more for an agency than just that upfront number that you see. I think it is very important to note right there. You spent a couple of minutes talking mainly about replacing lost business. And the, I mean, it's outside of this conversation. We're not diving deep into the numbers. This is not an analytical episode. This is really a high level, right. conceptual, uh, headspace kind of, of episode. But the simple fact is the numbers, the nuts and bolts retention, average account volume, policies per account, what is acquisition cost, what is your closing percentage, like all of these very important numbers are so badly skewed in favor of the independent channel. Uh, off the top of your head, you're an, you're an ops lady. I know you're deep into that side of the agency. What was your closing percentage at your captive agency? Oh gosh, um, it, Illinois at the time probably twelve to fifteen percent would be the average in the area. Ours was far yeah, higher. Yeah, yours was you know, was probably that, close to double that yeah. if I had to guess. You know, yeah, high teens, low twenties is probably yeah. somewhere. In, you said twenty seven. Well, our agency, I think, was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. That's more than double the, the typical average. But think about it, 27% for a closing percentage. What was your average retention? Just pull a number out of a hat there. Well, my agency had a five-year total P&C retention of 91% for Home and Auto, which is extremely high yeah. for a captive during the You're years that I was an agent. basically it was 10 points above year average? Year. It's 78 to 82 oh, yeah. is it, anywhere in, in there. that but it was when, when I was and a captain. it wasn't long after my after I sold my book that they uh, I think had some premium decreases but those were not my experience when wow. I was an agency owner so we had a great retention team we really and they didn't um, really speak with me as the agent I had a, a licensed client care and retention team that took care of our clients but um, we reached out and it had outbound processes for reaching out to clients at the renewal. We weren't afraid to wake the sleeping giant. We knew exactly how we were going to have a conversation with them about the factors that went into their premium increase, what their options were, what we could do about it, and the role that an umbrella would play in helping to protect them from lawsuits. So we were a well-oiled machine and we really had that down. And it's something that I think really works when you're focusing on having that trusted advisor conversation. Are you having a total risk review with a client? Are you really getting to know them? And yes, on the independent world, now I can take being a trusted advisor to a whole new level. Now I can really find out what the best fit for you is. Now I can really customize something for you. Now I can really give you great, great coverage. But I think that those processes that I had to develop in a very, um, Oh gosh, in an environment where it would have been very easy to lose clients, I had to really be in the details and make sure that we were not missing on our retention processes. Um, that Those years absolutely have influenced the service training programs and processes that we use here at Quantum. Um, our clients are the heartbeat of Quantum and it's a big deal to us that when they call Quantum, that they receive the best experience they've ever encountered in the insurance world. And unfortunately, 
with this huge array of like options that we have in the independent world that can so well like protect our clients a lot of times in the independent world the challenge is that becomes a price conversation and it can be very common for independent insurance agents to be very transactional and so our passionate quantum is to always slow down the call never have a call handle time like you would see in a call center where you would rush a client off of the phone and we train our team on our quantum serving with purpose model where we're confirming the need and creating peace of mind before we ask any transactional conversations after problem solving how to do a quick coverage checkup so they're getting a midterm policy review how to create a client for life and what steps go into that and then we use um, I mean there's so much I could talk to as far as how we how we calibrate and score that kind of conversation but I think it's just something important for me to share that with you guys because you're going to hear me talk about high, vo high volume new business sales a lot because I'm so passionate about what that can do to change your business model and change the trajectory of your agency's future. But um, I just want you to know that at Quantum, we, we, we hear you. We know that the clients need to have that consultation when they call in and not just someone who's like okay sure I added your new car you're good to go your, your, your vehicle's been added to your policy um, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that quantum does the customer service for our agency force so we um, quantum serves clients through two different branches so we have our quantum team and our flagship locations in Fredericksburg Virginia and Allen Texas and these are our w2 employees um, that our, 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 uh, our leadership team, our insurance sales consultants, our insurance client care consultants, but then we also have our amazing agency force um, in all in many, many states across the country. And so when they come on board to Quantum, they are really counting on us to do a great job with their clients. And so we, we put our team through a lot of training there. I think it's huge because retention is a big piece of that puzzle and it's a big piece of your business plan that has to fall into place for sure. So you you hit on a lot of things. Before I, I go to the end of what you just said, I want to revisit uh, something that was early in that block there. Great, so much value. You really need to go back and listen to that three minutes again. Uh, just hit the back button and listen to the whole thing again because Caitlin put out some serious gold nuggets there uh, of exactly what the process looks like, some of the, the bullet point items that they go through with their team at Quantum. There's a lot to unpack there. So I know from, I didn't catch all of that in its full value at, as she was saying it. So especially for you guys that are listening to this podcast at 1.5 or 2x speed, you know who you are. Go ahead and back <laughs> it up and listen again to make sure you catch what she just said. Because as far as process and system, there's some really good stuff in that little block. Um, before we go, I have to make the point because I know there are people listening to this episode that for whatever reason are still in the captive world. I want to make sure I hit on that point from a few minutes ago. You said your closing percentage was roughly 27%. And that, for a captive agent, is phenomenal closing percentage. I was five or six points above average when I left my farmer's agency, when I sold it, and we were at 18.2%. That's the best we ever got. Which is great for Captain. We, we, yeah, awesome. I mean it's not Especially nearly as good as twenty seven. Don't don't mix that up for yeah. sure. But yeah, I mean we were well <laughs> above average at eighteen percent. Uh, but let me ask you this: How much commercial were you selling at the time? Virtually nothing. Virtually right? nothing. I hadn't yet <laughs> discovered the sweet nectar of yeah. commercial insurance. Uh, yeah. I, I had a yeah. couple of accounts it's a game here and there. Yeah that had wandered aimlessly into my agency and said, hey, can I get a quote for insert commercial thing here? I had a couple of attorneys, a couple of CPAs and whatever, but the captive world, and I'll say this, I will own this, and it is a factual statement. The captive world, when it comes to the coverage options and commercial, when it comes to the underwriters that work at a captive carrier, there are not sophisticated underwriters nearly to the degree of the independent world. When I look at the conversations that I've had from a Chubb, a Liberty, a Hartford, a State Auto, a Travelers, a CNA, uh, an Amtrust, 
insert commercial underwriter there. The level of sophistication with the risk selection, with the actuarial data, it's like the minor leagues with the captive carriers because these underwriters know one flavor, and that's it. They only know one flavor because they're only ever exposed to one flavor. They get the same ROSR risks over and over and over again. Retail, office, service, and restaurant. ROSR. We had that beat into our heads so much as captive agency owners. And here's the thing. The underwriter, I had to say this because we don't talk about this very often. <laughs> and somebody in, in IAOA, it's been a couple of weeks ago now, but they were railing on the underwriters. And I, I had to come in and I commented, I'm like, hold on a second here. The underwriters have a career arc just like an agency owner does. You catch an underwriter who's early in their career, who maybe doesn't know exactly how all the ins and outs go, are you going to blast them because maybe they got something wrong or they weren't aware of some you know, exclusion or policy form tucked in there somewhere that you know about, Mr. 15-year agency owner? Uh, okay, let's hold on a second. Why don't you instead go to the underwriter and say, hey, I know this is what you said just in your last email, are you aware that, insert factual, helpful information here, are you aware that that is the case? Would you be able to insert alternative outcome here? If I ask you nicely, would you be willing to reconsider based on the following information? That's awesome. how you talk to an underwriter, people. You don't <laughs> get all hissy fit and blast them. And that's a completely different subject. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm totally rabbit trailing here. Well, so uh, so you're saying talk to underwriters like they're humans and we want to be decent and polite? And <laughs> I think so often, the age, especially newer, less experienced agents, because, man, in the captive world, there's only one option. You only have one underwriter for a given territory, for a given line of business. And if that underwriter says no, you don't have any other options. You're going to lose that prospect. So standard business practice for a, a commercial line's captive agent is you bend that underwriter to your will. You demand that they do what you want them to do, and you give them 17 reasons why. And my gosh, that is just a terrible idea in the independent world, because you know what's going to happen? That, that independent underwriter for insert carrier name is going to say, no. No, no, and now I'm pissed, and I don't like you, and I'm going to make sure your sales executive knows that you treated me this way, and you're on bad footing with that carrier now. It, it, it's just the way that things work in the captive world is so completely elementary by comparison. What is expected of the agency owner on the independent side, what you have to do to succeed now as an independent it's multi-dimensional. Yeah, it's a three-dimensional chess, yeah. you know, as opposed. Yeah. You, you're not just looking at close ratio. Yeah. There, there's so many other sorry. factors. Each carrier that you're working with is going to bring you different. Revenue. I'm impossible so to follow, so funny, Caitlin. James, I'm sorry. But, but no, before I start talking numbers again, because I could talk all day about yeah. those, um, y'all. Uh, <laughs> what James, the advice he was just giving on how to negotiate, if you haven't. Uh, looked up YouTube videos from Chris Voss yet. Yes. He will teach you the appropriate way to negotiate, yeah. <laughs> which is well in line with what James is trying to share with us here about not trying to strong arm it. And um, I think he was a lead like FBI negotiator in, in hostage situations. Yeah. And it's so fascinating uh, when he shares about like how to have conversations and find that common ground. And I feel like oh, if Chris Voss can do it with a, uh, you know, with a gun to somebody's head. A... <laughs> yeah. So his uh, book, just, just as, as a quick aside, there. his book, Never Split the Difference. If you only mm -hmm. let me pick five books and I told someone who's launching Whoa. their independent mm -hmm. agency, you have five books to pick. Never Split the Difference would definitely be one of those five books. Absolutely. Are you going to do an episode and tell us the other four? That's a great idea. I hadn't considered that. But, yeah, I'm totally down for that. Like a cliff notes session, you could bring somebody on that's read each one of them. That'd be cool. Oh but man! Now I'm curious what the other ones are. Well, I can't tell yeah, you not, now. You it, you uh, you laid it out the groundwork for a great future episode, so I can't say it as we're recording. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's nothing one dimensional about the independent industry, you guys, and so um, there's a lot to figure out there. You've got 
different moving parts and pieces about what your strategy going to be, what's your mix of business going to be, what numbers you're going to be looking at. And and that that is one of the huge driving reasons that Justin decided that Quantum was going to offload the customer service for agencies. Not because our agencies couldn't do it, but and not because they didn't want to do it, but because have, giving yourself the ability to focus and zero in on all of the moving pieces that have to happen for growth are already going to stretch you far enough. And so we, uh, we really wanted to create an ecosystem where agents have the tool belt that they need to succeed in recruiting and getting the right talent in your agency in marketing and the right digital acquisition plans to get you in front of the right clients and the right carrier mix so that you are well positioned to be able to have these high level trusted advisor conversations and and there's so much more that goes into that that i that i could wax eloquent on james but um when you take the customer service out of the picture and you trust Quantum's team to, to handle that, you know, that baby for mm -hmm. you, which is really hard to hand over. It frees you to be able to step out of that one dimensional mode and start looking at things like what's my lead to quote conversion ratio? Yep. What's my quote to close ratio? Okay, now I know what my close ratio is, but what was my cost of acquisition per sale for for this lead source? Uh, what's my revenue for this carrier? Maybe I sold less with this carrier, but it's more revenue per sale with that carrier. You're gonna have a different revenue yep. um, for each carrier that you're working with. And so being able to free yourself to dive into that level of like, here's how I'm gonna grow my agency and be really strategic about your growth um, can be a game changer. Well, and when you have so many tools to play with, it requires a lot of discipline to decide, one, which tool do you want to, to get really proficient at? Because, you know, if all you, whoever said it, it was, you know, brilliant. If all you ever do is swing a hammer, that everything looks like a nail. <laughs> but, you know, if you spend some time in the wood shop, to use your analogy, and you get proficient with, you know, two or three or four different tools, then you're able to get a lot more things accomplished. You know, quick example, to your point, mm -hmm. um, we had a, just a fantastic Q2 uh, with Liberty Mutual as one mm -hmm. of our one of our best. Uh, I really like them. And just as an aside, they're not a sponsor or anything. They never will be of this podcast. But <laughs> Liberty Mutual's Inland Marine family of products. It is a Swiss Army knife for the small commercial agent. Their Inland Marine suite from leased equipment uh, to contractors to installation floaters to Bailey's coverage to insert mm -hmm. name here, it is just a phenomenal set of products. And out of I, I'm an SIAA. Um, I, I've been with them since the beginning. Very happy with Coverica as our, our local representative. Out of 84 agents in Coverica's family, agencies, I should say, eight. There's a lot more than 84 agents. Um, we were the number one in Q2 with Liberty, and it's because it was, thank you. It, it's because there was focus there. Because back in February, as we're coming out of the insanity of this winter storm, which if you're not in the South, then you don't know anything about what happened in the state of Texas. It was total calamity for two weeks. Uh, but we came out of that, and I'm sitting here going, we need a little bit more focus with our commercial efforts. And I, I reached out to our top four or five carriers and said, what do you want to write that you're not seeing a lot of submissions for? I reached out to underwriters and said, hey, what's our target? If I contact you with a submission for insert class of business here, what are you going to be eager to write? And I got that list from people, and I started going out and, and figuring out, okay, who do I know in those verticals? What centers of influence do I know in, in those verticals? And we ended up placing a good amount of business with Liberty. And be, because of that, they come back and say, hey, we really like what you did. Here's an extra few points of commission for Q3 as, a, as an incentive to keep doing that. But that doesn't happen unless we, as agency owners, are paying close attention to the tools in front of us and not giving in to shiny object syndrome, as as David Carruthers likes to say. And I think, and I've, I've said this before, and I'll keep saying it because it's really important for both captive agents and new independents 
to know, if you've been an independent agent, uh, an agency owner uh, or principal for anything longer than a couple of years, you probably already figured this out. But more contracts, more appointments does not in any way equate to automatically more business. And I, I think there is this lie that captive agents tell themselves because they get beat so often by an independent agent. As you said, 27%, and you were phenomenal, best in class captive agent, 27%. You know what that means? You're losing 73% of your quotes. I, right. I don't know about you, but I'm not okay with that. The majority of those quotes were probably not lost to State Farm or AAA or whatever. They were probably lost to a well-equipped independent agency that had better options than you did. The challenge is too many of these captive agents and new IA people is they fall into the fallacy of thinking, I just need more appointments. I need more options. I need more products to sell which, in my opinion, is a really dangerous thing to be doing as you're setting up your new flavor. So, I think that there's definitely, gosh, there's always a place for simplicity, right? Efficiency is a factor. And you have to think about your team's bandwidth when they're having your sales conversation, what your sales process is going to look like. And if you have a personal alliance agent who's, Set, quoting live over the phone, they, you know, they don't they don't need to be juggling forty different <laughs> options. They need to know their carriers well and be ready to be able to have a good conversation about what's going to be a right fit for that person. On the commercial side, it's a little bit different, uh, but I I agree with you. I think there's a complexity uh, to the carrier aspect of things and it, it's definitely important to be strategic and really know what what markets you're going after no i completely agree i, I think <laughs> it's not just a bad idea it's dangerous because it it can take you so far off of where you should be uh, that you are spending time on things that you shouldn't be spending time on and there's so many things competing for our focus and so being able to zero in your focus and your energies on a plan that you can execute is invaluable. And so we have to constantly be intentional about reevaluating where our distractions are coming from, where we're getting spread too thin, yeah. and where we could zero in a little bit more closely, get a little bit more clarity on the, on the target. So we are at 52 minutes at this point. We're close to the end. You guys have what I see as two parallel tracks. Am I right that you run a retail agency yourself uh, as Quantum has a retail a house agency, or is it all about your agency owners? Uh, it, I, I haven't done some digging on your website, so maybe I have a wrong impression here, but are, are you guys both operating your own agency and supporting your, your franchise owners, or are you guys just all in with your franchise owners? Um, I don't. I don't personally own an insurance agent. I'm not like an insurance agency owner with a location or anything like that. I'm the director of no, education. No, I, I get. That. I just now, mean Quantum, so I, like your and, office, you and Justin yeah. and your team. Sorry. Great question. So Quantum is an independent agency, and we have uh, W two employees mm -hmm. in Virginia and Texas, and so that's our. Those are people who are you know Quantum team members, and we train them for sales and service and various admin and leadership roles. But then we also have our 1099 agency ownership opportunity where an agency can come on board to Quantum and, and open up a Quantum agency. Their agency would have, you know, its own name, but would um, be a part of the, the Quantum family and have access to the tool belt that we've created to help them succeed. Awesome. Anything you want to add here? We've had a, a diverse conversation, which I'm not at all surprised, uh, get, given the interest that, that you and I have in a variety of areas. Uh, is there anything that you want to leave the listeners with uh, as, as a, a last thought or a word of advice or, or caution even? Oh, sure. Absolutely. We just, we just love agency owners. We're so passionate about small business owners. Small business owners are putting their all into creating this legacy for their family. And when a small business owner in America succeeds, it has such a huge impact on their community. And so everything that we do is, is centered around really thinking about how we help these people make those dreams become a reality. So, so when you, when you think about quantum, 
I don't want you to think about quantum as like, hey, they're here to be, you know, a big player in the game. We're here to change the game. We feel like there's a lot going on in the industry that could be moved for the better. And we're here to influence the industry as a whole for positive change and move this um, opportunity in a positive direction that's going to make sense for agency owners, not just today, but in the future. And there's, gosh, there's just so much opportunity out there to um, make the, to really redefine what agency owners are expecting out of the insurance opportunity. I think we can raise the bar and, uh, and we're here to be a, um, to leave that, that footprint where we don't want to leave the industry the same. We don't want to just play the game and, and win and hit some big numbers. We want to 20 years from now, look back and feel like we somehow played a role in making the insurance world a better place. And my goal is that 20 years from now, we do have high school students and college students in their 20s that are telling us, I want to be an insurance agency owner, and that we've um, succeeded by, by changing that path. You know, I think the best way to do that is to continue making a positive difference in our communities. Uh, to, and that's not something we've talked a lot about to this point. Uh, we simply haven't gotten to it. It's in there, I promise you. The community engagement part uh, of the agency yes. is very important to me personally. Uh, but when when the agency owner, when the team is at the town square, when they are giving back uh, to the nonprofit, when they're volunteering at the soup kitchen, when they're sponsoring that Little League baseball team, when they're doing the things outside of selling a policy that gets someone to, to think, hey, who is that? What's that name I see on that jersey? What's that billboard over there? Hey, who are those people volunteering for that cause that I care about? Oh, well, that's an insurance agency? Huh. Well, they look like they're having a lot of fun. I wonder, How does that work? I wonder what that might look like for me. And next thing you know, we have another generation of people that maybe go into college thinking, hey, maybe I can do this insurance thing. It looks like a cool business model. Because I promise you, I'm, I'm the same way. I never in a million years thought I'd be doing what I'm doing now. Never. never. It was not on the map. It wasn't an option. It wasn't even something I was aware of. I had always bought insurance, but honestly, I didn't even care about it. Like, I just checked the box. So it, I'm right there with you. I think that mission uh, is something that probably speaks to a lot of agency owners uh, because as, uh, as Chris Paradiso is, is fond of saying, uh, <laughs> we are... Uh, stale and pale and male. Uh, the industry as a whole <laughs> is not getting any younger. The average agency principal, I think, is like 54 years old or something like that. Wow. Um, <laughs> so bringing new blood in and having a good succession plan, yes. man, that's just critical. Love what you're saying there. It's so fun, and we're so blessed. And congrats on your Q2 because uh, I know you shared your numbers on social media, and you guys are doing great things. So you know, I'm really impressed uh, the with the production <laughs> per team member, you know? And that's really what exactly. it comes down to to me, mm -hmm. is, is there's the whole comparison thing, I think, is mm -hmm. such a useless exercise because there's so many different variables so many that come into play. Line of business is one thing. You know, somebody commented on that thread, mm -hmm. wow, $7,800 uh, you know, per client, that's great. And I'm thinking, yeah, mm -hmm. but that's because there's four or five accounts in there that are you know, well north of 50000 in premium. So uh, having that comparison. But that per producer, that per that, yeah, it, producer average is very high at risk yeah. well. And you guys are really accomplishing so much. And you, uh, you shared on your podcast how much more quickly you were able to hit that level in the independent world than you did yeah. as a captive. And... I think you and I both want that to be the norm, yeah. right? Like, don't we want to see other agency owners experience that same level of success? Absolutely. And be able to hit numbers that, like right now, like, oh, that's what the top agents do. But wouldn't it be awesome if one day where you are now at Riskwell was the norm? If, the if we, wouldn't that be we amazing? go forward five years and what we've done to this point is the 50th percentile, is the middle of the bell curve. Mm -hmm. Because I know mm -hmm. offices like Quantum. I know offices like Riskwell we're going to be two or three standard deviations north of the mean, no matter what the mean is. That's just how we're wired. So if the mean, if the general normal agent is enjoying grand success 
awesome because whatever yes. they're doing, I know the leaders are going to be that much further ahead. So if if the the average gets elevated significantly, so these agents that are maybe struggling a little bit with figuring out how do I grow profitably, if, if we can, through agency freedom, through age of independence and other completely free resources, by the way, I'm not charging for any of this. I haven't seen you charge for anything. Charles Specht and Cass and Carruthers, like, there's so much value being delivered completely for so much. free. The, it's just up to the agency owner, uh, the, the aspiring or current owner, what are you going to do with it? It's ripe for the taking. What are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. So, um, man, I don't know if there's a better way to end it. You got anything else to add before we wrap this thing? Thanks for having me on, James. Yeah. And if y'all haven't caught episode four, make sure you backtrack. That was a good one. <laughs> episode four. I'm trying to remember which one. I think it's contracts. Yes. That, that was uh, episode six was the legal and regulatory. And I'm looking mm. at the numbers, and episode six is our best performing episode so far. And honestly, really? that was what I thought was going to be like really yet. dry and not that interesting. But it is by far <laughs> the best performed by like 70 downloads. Wow. Uh, it's, it's number one, wow. which is just weird to me. That's so, awesome. A lot of people out there going, well, I don't want to get chewed. I don't want to face regulatory fines and penalties. <laughs> I better know this stuff. Um, well... I did a cybersecurity episode not long ago, so you're giving me hope that it'll <laughs> that the fish will bite. Oh out. yeah, <laughs> it's one of those like necessary topics. Has, you know? has to be because I mean there is nothing more be, urgent for a business owner than to get their cybersecurity and cyber liability and data breach policies in line. I, I was literally talking about that at chamber this morning, literally eight, eight hours ago, banging that drum of guys. You all need to get better prepared because the ones that don't have anything is the majority, and the people that have cyber coverage have it as an endorsement on a BOP. And there's virtually no first-party coverage at all. Sorry, we don't have time for that. Uh, but well, yeah. Here's what it comes down to. Y'all spend all your time protecting everybody else. So let's carve in a little time for some self-care yeah. here and protect yourself <laughs> from cyber How security How many threats, insurance so. agency owners don't have a standalone cyber policy in their mm. office? Well, you listening right now, you freedom jumper, I'm going to talk to you for a second and meddle, <laughs> just all the way meddle in your affairs as an agency owner. Do you have a cyber policy? I know one person is about to because he's a great listener and he reached out to me and was like, Hey, can you help me get a cyber policy for my office? I'm like, yeah, of course I can. I love that. I, I'm all about the cyber policy. Why don't you just write it yourself? He goes, I don't have the right appointments on the commercial side of things, and I know how important that is, so why don't you just write it for me? I'm like, definitely. Mm -hmm. Love where your head's at. And how cool is it that th this guy is not prideful and be like, oh, you know what, I'll just get a, I don't know, Hiscox policy or something that you can hop online right. and write it yourself in five minutes, but it's full of holes. So, I mean. Just take care of yourself, Kudos. Kudos. Yeah. Hey, I, <laughs> that's really a great place to end. One of these days, we're going to have an episode that is less than an hour, I swear. The last four episodes <laughs> are ending up more than an hour, and I think that's just a reflection of, it's, it's because we talk for a living. We can't hold well, it. I think it's interesting because, you know, I'm going to go back and listen to this episode and pull apart the, the action items and to fill in the, uh, the episode recap and notes. So if you haven't already, guys, please go to agencyfreedompodcast.com. Sign up for the downloads. Every Friday morning at 6 a.m. Central Time, you get an email with episode notes and recap any of the resources that we've talked about with our guests, any of the action items that you need to be remembering, you get it dropped straight in your inbox so it's as easy as possible. So that is really it for this. Thank you so much, Caitlin Egger, with Quantum Assurance International. Did I say it right? You did. Thanks so much, James. I had so much fun and um, appreciate the chance to chat with 
your freedom jumpers. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks so much for being with us today. As always, I have the same three requests as we wrap this thing up. Subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to. Leave us a review. I think if you enjoy the content, you owe us like 20 seconds of your life to drop a quick review. And most importantly, third request, share Agency Freedom Podcast with somebody who's still in the captive world who needs to know what we're talking about because we are going to change lives and set people on a better course for their career. So that is it for today. As always, I'm your host, James Jenkins. Thanks for listening, and make it a great day, boys and girls. We will talk to you soon. Take care.